Good evening and welcome to Rye Hill Baptist Church for Wednesday evening, January the 6th, 2021. This evening's message brought to us by Brother Michael Franklin is entitled Complete Obedience. Enjoy. All right, I've got 6.30, so uh, we are going to start. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the night, and uh, God, I just thank you for the rain that you have provided. And God, I pray for the political unrest in our country. Uh, God, I just pray that uh, Cooler's head would prevail. Uh, God, I pray for law and order. And uh, God, I pray that you would just uh, give us peace. Uh, God, we love you. We thank you for your word. God, we thank you for just the lessons of life. Uh, we thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you have given us. So, God, as we open the Word, would you speak to us through it? And Lord, if there's just one thought, one thought that just uh, uh, stimulates us or just gets us started uh, doing something uh, for you, God, I just, I just pray it would be so this night. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5 with me. Luke chapter 5. I want to talk to you tonight about complete obedience. Complete obedience. And again, there's such thing as obedience, but uh, we are talking about uh, complete obedience, and I'll explain that here in just a few minutes. Let me give you the outline while we're here. Number one, Jesus the great teacher. Jesus, the great teacher. Folks, there was never, ever, ever a better teacher than Jesus Christ himself. And uh, I, just, I just can't wait to meet him and uh, just to talk to him. Uh, that's going to be an awesome time. Number two, Jesus, the great fisherman. And that, this may throw some of you off because he was a carpenter by trait. But as you know the story, he is a pretty good fisherman. A lot of people talk about how good they can fish. <laughs> but Jesus uh, showed how well he fishes. And number three, Jesus, the great discipler. The discipler. He had 12 disciples. And of course, this story here was early in the ministry. And uh, he was getting his people together. And he was going to pour his life into them. You know, Jesus' earthly ministry was truly awesome. While he taught and preach to huge crowds, Jesus always was concerned about individuals as well. Jesus took the time to minister to individuals and help them see the need for making him number one in their personal lives. With Jesus' transforming power given in salvation, plus the gift of the Holy Spirit, Jesus would send them out to share his message of salvation with others. In Luke 5, Jesus meets with uh, four people for the four meets with four people for the sole purpose of making them a witness for the cause of Christ. Let's look at the first call of four fishermen. Four fishermen. In Luke chapter one, Jesus the great teacher. So it was as the multitude pressed about him to hear the word of God that he stood by the lake of Gesserit and saw and saw two boats standing by the lake. But the fishermen had gone from them and were washing their nets. Then he got into one of the boats, which was Simon, and asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the multitudes from the boat. See, Jesus, uh, in his teaching, uh, was, had a, a twofold ministry. Uh, one, when it was salvation, it usually in, you know, uh, encompassed a, a multitude of people. But also, you'll see all through the Gospels, uh, Jesus would be with maybe four of them or six of the disciples or even all the disciples. And that's when he was discipling them. And so a lot of times you'll read in Scripture, he started out teaching the disciples, and then a multitude uh, would come and listen to him preach. And I, I just, again, I, I can't imagine sitting under the teaching and preaching of Jesus. I mean, you, you are talking about the Son of God. 
Okay, you, you were talking about uh, the great teacher, the great I am. And I know when he spoke, he spoke with uh, Holy Spirit power. And so, uh, again, just to meet Jesus personally in heaven. And I had a guy ask me the other day, he said, how are everybody, I mean, you, you look at the line behind Jesus. You know, Jesus will be there. And if everybody wants to see him, how is that going to take place? You know what my answer was? we got all eternity. I'll, I'll stand in line. You know, you're not going to sweat it. You're not going to be mad. All right, you're going to be in heaven. All right, so he was a great teacher. Uh, look at Luke chapter 4. Just go back. You may, not, you may not even have to turn the page, but you have to, I have to turn the page in mind. Luke 4, verse 42. Now when it was day, he departed and went to a deserted place. And the crowd sought him and came to him. And he tr- and tried to keep them from leaving. But he said to them, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. Folks, Jesus was fulfilling his purpose in life. And I tell you what, folks, I can relate to this. Uh, there is nothing I would rather do than to preach the word of God. Uh, there's nothing better for you than to be in the center of God's will. And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, I know you want me to stay in, but he kept moving. Why? Because he wanted everyone to hear the gospel and he wanted to teach all people, Jews as well as Gentiles. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. Now turn to Matthew chapter 4. Matthew 4. I want you to see this. Matthew chapter 4. Verse 18, and Jesus walked by the Sea of Galilee and saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, and they were fishermen. And he said unto them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they immediately left their nets and followed him. So you can see the calling of these first two disciples. And and folks, the you know, the simple thing, the command was follow me. And you think about that, folks. That was their trade. That's how they made money. That was their livelihood. And in some instances, that's probably all they knew. But Jesus' power, Jesus' presence, uh, being in the, you know, in the presence of the Son of God, they just they were moved by God and moved by his words. And they immediately followed them. Uh, Verse 20 says, they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee's father, mending their nets. And he called them, and immediately they left their boat and their father and followed them. Left their business. Peter, James, and John left Andrew left their business, and in the point, and, and you know, that's what Jesus had said, you know, uh, it, it would seem, we're, we're not supposed to hate our mothers and fathers, but we, we don't put anything uh, in front of Jesus. That's what he was saying later on in the other Gospels. So that was the calling, and Jesus, in, in his teaching, and, and folks, truly, he just poured his life in the, into the disciples, his life into him. He taught them personally. He led by examples. He, uh, you know, he, he never did a miracle to show off, all right? He did miracles for spiritual reasons. There were all, there were always spiritual lessons behind every miracle he did. Now look at verse four. And when they had stopped, when he had stopped speaking, he said to Simon, Launch out, launch out into the deep and let your nets, let down your nets for a catch. So Jesus, after he was teaching, the group, the masses, thought, now I need to teach Peter a lesson. And notice what it says, launch out into the deep. Folks, by this time, it was daytime, all right? And I'm certainly not a fisherman. But, the, but everyone that I've read and what I've read, even in commentaries, uh, Peter knew the best fishing was at, 
at night in shallow water. And you'll find on down here that he fished all night and caught nothing. So here he is, tired. He, he you know, was uh, preached to. He, he listened to Jesus. But yet, what Jesus said to him, okay, to a fisherman, did not make sense. Okay, it wasn't practical. It wasn't the best way to catch fish. But again, Jesus had a lesson that he wanted to teach Peter and these disciples. So we see the great teacher, and now we see the great fisherman. Look at verse 5. But Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have told all night and caught nothing. That happens quite a bit when I go fishing, okay? I don't know about you, all right? But I, I'm not a commercial fisherman, and, and it just happens. And, and here's the word that I love. Nevertheless, okay? Uh, you know, you could interpret that a lot of ways. But what I think Peter was saying, you know what? I don't think we're going to catch anything. But to humor you, We'll do what you say. Nevertheless, at your word, I will let down the net. Now, folks, the S on the first part is so important in this story. Jesus told him to let the nets down. Go to the deep and let the nets down, plural. Peter says, I, I mean, I was trying to think of a term today. Whatever. You know how kids say that? Whatever. Peter was... Basic, nevertheless, to me, he was saying, whatever, okay, if you want me to do it, I'll let a net down. I don't think I'm going to catch anything. Because if he thought he was going to catch something, he would have let nets down, not a net. All right? At your word, I will let the net down. Again, you know, he, he was following what he said. He was obeying him, but not to the T, not doing exactly what the Lord told him to do. And folks, I associate this with strong faith and small faith. I don't know about you, but I want to confess, my faith is not always strong. I have faith. I use faith. I pray in faith. But there are just some times I doubt. Man doubts. Satan wants to put things in your head too, okay? And so here... I would just, I just, looking at this, Peter was showing small faith, all right? And it says, and when they had done this, they caught a great number of fish. And again, there's not a number per se. They didn't say 155 fish. They just said when they did, when they did what Jesus wanted them to do, they caught a bunch of fish, which again goes against everything they think about fishing. It was at night. It was in the middle of the daytime. It wasn't in shallow water. It was out in deep. But folks, what we need to understand is, even in the spiritual connotation, when Jesus tells us to do something, we need to do it. We need to do it. And a great number of fish. And their net was breaking. One net. Notice that it wasn't a plural. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. All right? They just, they were just could not literally bring up the net for all the fish that were in this net. So you talk about getting some fishermen excited. All right? Jonathan, a week ago, I, I, I don't know, I think it was a week ago Saturday, was fishing in Carl's Pond. Okay? And... He, I wasn't there, but I'm just telling you, I know exactly how he is. He threw out in the middle and set it on the bottom with some minnows. And even his father-in-law said, you're joking. You're, you're making this up, you know. He was pulling so hard, and he, he kept saying he was hung up. And Jonathan said he could feel the fish on the line moving and swirling. And to make a long story short, he caught a 15-pound flathead catfish in Carl's pot. All right? Now, do you not think he got excited? You know how people do I've seen him do it. When they start and get excited like that, they just start backing up the bank. You ever seen people do that? And I'm telling you, when you're a fisherman and you, you land something like that, your heart is beating, it's going crazy. 
And this is what was going on in there. When they saw how many fish was in there, and they hollered, they hollered. Let me give you an Oklahoma and an Arkansas. They hollered at their friends, okay? Come and help. And they came, look at this, and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. Boy, you talk about Peter. I'm telling you, I believe about this point, conviction got all over him. All right? He thought, we ain't going to catch nothing. We worked at it. We know how to fish. They're not biting. But folks, I am telling you, you just should not just partially do what the Lord tells you to do. You should not half-heartedly do what the Lord tells you to do. You should do it with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And then verse 8, And when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at his knees. Why do you get on your knees? In worship, folks. He realized truly who Jesus was. He realized truly, hey, I I could not make this happen. I don't even believe in luck, folks. All right? I don't believe in luck at all. I believe in divine providence. God and Jesus made this happen. Peter doubted, and so he fell on his knees, and he worshiped the Lord God, Jesus, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man Oh, Lord. Hold your finger there and go to Matthew chapter 17 with me. Matthew chapter 17. I want to give you an example that Jesus was teaching the disciples. Matthew 17, verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him kneeling down to him and saying, notice again, kneeling in worship, in respect, in awe. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he's epileptic and he suffers severely, for he often falls into fire and into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And folks, we know how it is to have a child that is sick, to have a special needs child. It's hard. Your, your, your heart aches, even when I see them out in public and, and things. And in verse 17, and then Jesus answered and said, said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. See, the disciples could not do it. The disciples tried. I'm sure they prayed over him. Prayed over him. And folks, I believe with all my heart, with God, nothing is impossible. But he, they could not do it. And Verse 18, and Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And, you know, Jesus had that kind of Holy Spirit power in him, folks. All right? There is physical battles, but I truly believe the hardest battles that we face are spiritual battles. Folks, we're in a spiritual battle right now. You look at our country, you look at the COVID, you look at the isolation, there are more depressed people right now than I feel like, and this is just my opinion, in the history of mankind. I mean, a lot of people think there's no hope. A lot of people think the, you know, uh, again, everybody has the right to an opinion you know, I'm not taking that shot. You know, they're, they're probably trying to kill us all. You know, they're just that negative and negative and negative thinking. But folks, the key here, and the reason I bring this up is, with Jesus, all things are possible. There's no such thing as an impossible situation with Jesus. Verse 19, and the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? Folks, You know, there's been times I probably have doubted my own prayers. I prayed with all my heart. I prayed according to James. I prayed, but yet God, uh, for some reason, chose not to answer my prayer. Folks, I have no healing power. Only God can do that. And sometimes we get discouraged, even in our praying. But Jesus gave them a key here. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, 
For assuredly, I say to you, if you have the faith that's a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. And folks, I I don't think we ought to be praying that God gives us the power to move mountains. We'll let man move the mountains. That's He's just using an example here. It is impossible for that to happen. But the next part, and nothing will be impossible for you. What is he saying? He's saying it, it is tied directly with our faith and God's power. God's power. Folks, your prayers don't have to be long. They just need to be sincere. Your prayers just need to be, uh, you know, uh, reverent. Your prayers just uh, need to be fervent is another word. But the, the key there is in Jesus' name. Folks, Jesus had the power to, uh, you know, uh, get the demon out of that child. And then he gives another hint here, verse 21. However, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Praying we know a lot about, and I'm, this is not a lesson on fasting. But let me tell you, let me give you a key to fasting. Fasting is the attitude of the heart. Fasting is saying, I am going to pray hard. I'm going to pray the hardest I can. Matter of fact, I am not even going to eat. I'm not going to eat. I am going to skip meals, and in my time, I usually eat. I am going to go in my closet, and I'm going to pray and pray and pray. It's praying with burden, folks. It's praying as if someone's life does mean something, and, and, and your prayers do mean something. And that's what I'm saying. I think sometimes, even I, there's times that my prayer life is good. It's strong. It's, it's good. But even in my, my spiritual discipline sometimes, I just don't feel like I pray enough. I don't pray sincerely enough. And that's what Jesus was saying. Jesus had the power to do that. But he also gave the disciples that power. You can see in the Gospels, when he sent them out, he gave that apostolic power for that day and for that time. So we see Jesus, the great teacher. We see Jesus, the great fisherman. And we see Jesus, the great discipler. Look back in our text. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the fish which they had taken. Folks, if he'd been teaching the multitudes, then there were still a lot of people on that shore. There were still people probably wondering what he was doing in Peter's boat and why he told the fishermen to to launch out. You know, they had just basically gave up and they were washing their nets and they were just thinking, hey, it's a day, we'll go get a nap or two and then we'll try it again tonight. But when they heard Peter and the disciples, when they saw the amount of, a fish. You could not, I'm just saying, you cannot fathom how many fish it would take for two people. Now, just two in a boat from what this is saying, and yet the boats, boats, plural, were almost sinking. So word got around. People saw what was going on. There was an excitement in the air. In verse 10 it says, And so also were James and John, the sons of Debedes, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, do not be afraid. What is he saying? Why would they be afraid? Okay, they were fishermen. Because they saw something they had never seen before. Folks, new experiences are hard in our lives. There are a lot of people that will never experience the power of God because they're afraid. There are a lot of people that will do that. Folks, I am telling you, the Bible says fear is not from God. Fear is not from God. He gives us power. He gives us a sound mind according to Timothy, 1 Timothy. And we need to understand when Jesus is around, there is no reason for us to fear. And it says, from now on, you will catch men. You will catch men. What was Peter and Andrew and John and James? What were they comfortable with? Catching fish. What did Jesus try to tell them? Listen, 
this is a turning point in your life. This is a defining moment in your life. You are good fishermen. I'm the best. I mean, he wasn't bragging, saying I'm the best, but Jesus proved he was the best fisherman. No doubt. But he was saying, fish are important. You've got to pay your bills. I understand all that. But it, be, catching men is way more important than catching fish. And folks, that is the spiritual lesson that he was trying to teach the disciples. So, verse 11, so when they had brought their boats to land, they forsook all and followed him. Folks, the, Jesus was basically trying to say, hey, you've been a fisherman probably your whole life. It's time to change vocations. It's time to change. And folks, I'm just telling you, uh, you know, there, there are a lot of men that have been called to preach and they didn't answer the call until they were in their 60s and in their 70s. Matter of fact, I had a, a man this week come up to me and tell me, he said, I'm 73 years old, and two weeks ago God called me to preach. And you know what my answer was? Well, I'm glad you answered the call. Because folks, if he's been called to preach, that man's never going to be happy until he does what God tells him to do. And when there's a vocational change, when we're out of our comfort zone, that's when we fear. And Jesus was simply telling them, hey, trust me, trust me. And it says, and when they brought their boats to the land, they forsook all. Folks, those two words are so important. No turning back. No turning back. And followed him. And we know the rest of the story. Uh, they were full-time uh, basically, Jesus' disciples full time for three and a half years. It comes down to this. Folks, the most important catch in life are lost souls. Lost souls. And I've read this uh, scripture a lot of times. Turn with me to uh, Matthew chapter 13. Matthew 13, but it, it kind of just came alive to me this week as I was uh, looking at this lesson. And I, 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 I want to say this example. It depends on what you feel like you want for your life. See, a lot of people settle for good things. And there is nothing wrong with good things. Some people even, you know, they're, they're more disciplined and uh, they put more effort out and they do more and things are even better. There's good, there's better. But do you know what God wants for your life? He wants best. He wants what's best for you. He wants you to fulfill your potential in everything that you do spiritually. Matthew chapter 13, verse 3. And he spoke many things to them in parables saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow. And as he sowed some feed, fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth because they had no depth of the earth. But when the sun uh, was up, they scorched, and because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell among thorns, and thorns sprang up and choked them. Verse 8, but others fell on good ground and yielded a crop. And some hundredfold some 60 and some 30, he who has ears, let him hear. I've always, that last verse always kind of just bothered me. I thought, what is he talking about? Why is he throwing out some, uh, you know, 60, some 100, some 30? Folks, I want to associate that with good, better, and best. See, what God tells us to do is just to sow. Just to sow. You're not going to win everybody that you, you know, that you give the gospel to. You, it's, you know, you're just not going to do that. But our job is simply to sow, to sow. And, and we need to be obedient in that sowing and let God. Matter of fact, the Bible says, you know, uh, we sow and we water and we, we plant and we water. But who gives the increase, folks? It's God. God gives the increase. But we will not have an increase if we do not 
soul. And I got to thinking about this uh, through the COVID. You know, we have not baptized one soul. And I don't know, maybe, maybe you, you know, I, I don't know. I, I really have struggled with this. Uh, probably in the last couple of weeks, it just it just hit me that our baptismal waters, and it's like I want to compare it to what's going on in our world too. Satan has got us so distracted, so distracted with everything else that's going on around. We're not sowing the seeds of the gospel. Jesus performed this miracle to show the disciples how important it was to catch men instead of catching fish. And I think in our own, you know, and we can make excuses and we can say, you know, hey, it's COVID, nobody's doing this and nobody's doing that. But folks, my Bible says with God, all things are possible. But for someone to get saved, somebody has to sow a seed. And I understand it starts right here. It starts right here. John chapter 2. And we're... We're well. Let's just go there. I'll, I'll, John chapter two. We've got time for it. This is Jesus's miracle. John chapter two. Jesus's first miracle, and we know it was uh, the miracle of the wedding. You know, Mary, his mother, said, "Hey, I want you to go to this wedding with me." You know, these are friends of the family, and you know, I, I would just really you know, like you to do that. And again, I think probably in Mary's case it was premonition. For some reason, she knew that Jesus had needed to be there. All right? Because twice early in Jesus' life, the Bible says Mary pondered these things. Mary knew there was something special about Jesus. And I think that motherly premonition told him, why don't you go with me? And he did. He obeyed. And they ran out of wine uh, we, we, we see that in verse 3. Look at verse 4. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. And some people would almost take that as being smart aleck to his mother. But folks, I don't think that's what he meant at all. What he meant was what you're asking me to do could cause a ruckus and a crowd. And people could start already. This was early. In John 2, this is early. This is the first miracle. And he was just trying to tell his mom, Mom, I'm just telling you, I don't really want the attention. My hour has not yet come. And then, verse 5, I love this. And his mother said to the servants, Whatever he says to you, do it. Why? Because she knew. She knew. Who Jesus was. She had been visited by an angel. The Holy Spirit was placed inside of her. God Himself was born through the Holy Spirit, and she was the mother of the miracle worker. So, folks, I say to you, I say to you, when Jesus tells you to do something, don't just partially do it. Don't say nevertheless, or don't say whatever, or I'll get to it when I can, or I just don't feel burdened about that. Whatever Jesus says to you, just do it. Complete obedience produces complete joy and peace in your life. Complete obedience produces complete joy and peace in your life. One last scripture. Luke 14 Luke 14, Luke 14, verse 33, Luke 14, 33, the Bible says, and again, we don't have time to read all the other, but this was the scripture uh, that had to do, hey, it, it ought to just almost appear that, you know, you hate your mother and your father, and, and again, they're not telling them to do that, Get, Jesus is not telling them to hate him. It means that you are so clued in to Jesus and what Jesus is doing. All right, it would seem that your, your family is not that important. And did you notice that about Jesus? I, I, just in Jesus' life, his family is not mentioned very much at all. Okay, not at all. 
in the Gospels. Very little in the Gospels. And I'm not saying we need to walk away from our families. That's not what I'm saying. But verse, verse 33 is what sums the whole thing up. So likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all, there's that word again, he told the disciples to forsake all, that he does not forsake all, that he, uh, he has cannot be my disciple. Folks, I am telling you, I want to be a disciple of Jesus Christ. And folks, Jesus is the best disciple. And I am challenging myself. We need to sow more seed. Father, thank you for the day. God, I know a lot of times we obey. But Lord, there's a difference between obeying and completely obeying. God, I want to be sold out to You. God, I want to uh, catch men. God, even in this pandemic, uh, God, we still need to be sowing uh, the Gospel of Jesus Christ. So God, I pray that we would ask You in prayer for divine appointments. God, I pray that our ears would be more sensitive. Sometimes we are so busy meeting physical needs of others that we don't think about the spiritual need of others. God, I pray that we can work the gospel into every conversation uh, that we have. God, again, not hitting people over the head with the Bible, but not backing up either. Taking the time to share what Jesus Christ has done in our lives. God, I thank you that when we do completely obey you, God, you show the increase. God, it's not us. It's not how good a presentation we have. God, it's simply sharing the gospel and allowing the Holy Spirit, through the Word of God, work in their lives. So God, thank you for this reminder uh, on this new year. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that uh, we will see our baptismal waters move. Matter of fact, that you, you convict me today. I was sitting right in my office today and you told me tomorrow, fill that baptistry up. Fill it up and pray that we use it. And God, I thank you for that. God, bless these, your folks. Thank you for them coming out. Just really a cold and nasty night. But God, I thank you for them being here this night. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We thank you for joining us this evening at Rahel Baptist Church. And my God richly bless you.